into it. Um, this was supposed to be studying the Old and New Testaments, how to study the Old and New Testaments, but uh, that was far too much information for just one class, so let's split it up into how to study the Old, and then next week we'll look at how to study the New. A lot of the concepts are the same, of course, uh, but there are different pitfalls, I guess, or things that we need to um, be wary of or to avoid. So just so you know, today this is just part one. So that little uh, booklet that I've given you, that has information for both this class and next class. So hold on to this one for next time because it'll it, the same information is there. And if you wanna, wanna look ahead at some of the points, you can do that. So our scripture, our guiding scripture for this time around. Um, and actually, let me say a little prayer for us just to open us. The Holy Spirit would be with us. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would teach us this morning. Open up our eyes to your word. Lord, help us to study it rightly, in spirit and in truth, Father. And Lord, to take what we learned here and go and to, to teach it and to show others, Lord, how to, how to look at your word, Father, as you, as you, as you have given it to us. We just praise you and we thank you for this day in the name of Jesus. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19 says, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What is Peter talking about when he says the prophetic word? fully confirmed. Like the Old Testament prophets and the early parts. Yeah, the Old Testament. The Old Testament, basically. The Testament, right? The Word, what it testifies to. The prophetic word of the prophets and of just the story of redemption. Just so what, what Peter's talking about here is we have the... You, the Old Testament, God's Word. When Paul speaks to Timothy and he talks about all Scripture is God breathed, he's talking about the Old Testament. That was in, that was a Scripture that they had, and of course, we now have it fully confirmed in the Apostles' teaching, the New Testament. We're going to look at. But Peter is saying we now we have the prophetic word, and we have the hindsight and the understanding to see it now fully confirmed. Peter, in that first generation, was recognizing that the Old Testament word was now confirmed fully in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So basically it was the mystery revealed in the New Testament. Correct? Yes, that long mystery that Paul speaks about is now fully confirmed. And Peter reminds us, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. We are told by Peter to pay attention to the Old Testament. It has much to teach us, amen? It's the same as it's God's Word. It remains God's Word. And so anyone who tries to tell you that we should unhinge from the Old Testament or should devalue the Old Testament or should see it as secondary to the New Testament uh, is going to get you in trouble. That goes against what Peter is saying right here. We can really only understand the, the, the depths of the New Testament by first understanding the Old Testament and vice versa. As we're going to see. So, this morning we're going to consider some of the unique principles you need to know in order to faithfully interpret both the Old and the New. These principles, or lenses as we've been calling them, serve as interpretational guardrails. That's the whole point of this class, really, is to give you some guardrails. Um, like I said, the way that the inductive Bible study method, some of these guides, these are not like the end-all, be-all, the only way you can study the Bible. They're just meant to be guardrails to help you. Use them as you will. I encourage you to pay attention to the guardrails. Obviously, you can drive on the street, but it's, it's going to help you if, you if you swerve to have some guardrails to protect you. Amen. Uh, I'm glad for guardrails when I was driving through uh, 
one time with my family in Scotland. Uh, we took our first trip to the UK and I remember uh, my dad rented a car and learned how to drive on the other side of the road and, and I was there to guide him and to say, Dad, stay left, stay left, keep on the left, keep on the left. That was my whole job was just everything, think everything left instead of being right, think left. And there's a point where my dad, he's very afraid of heights and we were driving through the Scottish Highlands, which is, as you know, uh, a lot of heights and drop-offs and moors and hills and valleys. And my mom, he said, okay, I'm gonna need your mom to take over to drive us through here. And uh, so she starts to drive and it was her first time. And I'm like, okay, mom, you gotta remember to stay left. Stay left, the whole family's in the car. And as she's going along and at one point, uh, staying left, <laughs> was she, she reverted back to her old ways and just at that time there was another car or truck coming and I'm like mom left 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 and she was able to get over and, and then at that point she said yeah my dad's like I'm more afraid of us hitting a car than I am of heights so I'll take back <laughs> so these are this is just me saying stay left <laughs> stay left pay attention to the guardrails now thank God that guardrail we would have maybe been hit by a truck but the guardrail at least would have saved us from plummeting hundreds of feet to our demise. Anyway, good morning. Wonderful, wonderful story, huh? Could have been in the end right there. Stay left is the point. Pay attention to the guardrails. These will keep you in the right path of correct interpretation. So interpreting the Old Testament, it's been said, is a bit like being watched carve the Thanksgiving turkey. Uh, if any of you know what that's like, I, you know, in my young life, I remember sitting there and being able to, it was always an honor, right, to carve the Thanksgiving turkey. If my grandpa would get out his electric turkey carver and go to town and, and cut up all the, I remember my grandma standing there making sure that he did it right. And, and then it went to my, my dad and he would do it. And I remember my grandma still there watching my dad and, and my mom and making sure they carved the turkey right. And then finally, this past year, it was my job to do the turkey and I smoked a turkey. And then I brought it to the house and was the one who had to carve it. And uh, it didn't go so well. I think I gave off, I passed it off to somebody else. But interpreting the Old Testament is a bit like watching someone while you carve the Thanksgiving turkey. It's fairly easy to start well but you quickly have to make some tricky decisions about which uh, everyone has an opinion <laughs> on how you should carve the turkey. And it's very easy to end up in a sticky mess with lots of parts left over that no one knows what to do with. Has anyone carved the Thanksgiving turkey? Okay. Would anyone call himself a pro at this point, carving the Thanksgiving turkey? Yeah, great. I believe that, I believe that. And it's definitely hard when someone is watching you carve the Thanksgiving turkey because there are some decisions that have to be made, um, opinions that people have. And so this goes into the idea of understanding the Old Testament is that it starts out, you may think, you know, easy, but if you're not careful to understand the context, what's going on, you can end up making a mess of things. You can end up coming away with some really odd interpretations. You can end up uh, harming your faith. Because the Old Testament is often used as the first starting place for agnostic types, atheist types, to take out a context, uh, to give you an opinion on. And if you don't understand what you're reading and the time and place and the purpose of what you're reading in the Old Testament, you can quickly get into some trouble. Remember what I told us about the Bible. The Bible is 66 books. It's a mini library. That's what the Bible means. And so if we're not careful to understand what kind of book we're in and when it was written and on and on, we can get ourselves in the trouble. For example, well, we're going to look at one of the examples. But for example, if, if you just read Leviticus the same way you read the Gospel of John or, or the same way you read Romans without any understanding of it and you just you, you take your, your turkey carver right into it, you can get into trouble. You can, you can end up with a, a sticky mess. It's going to take you time to put back together. So let's walk through on your sheet the five interpretive lenses, guardrails, to help us humbly examine and rightly interpret the Old Testament text. 
And the, you may have more guardrails, but these are um, some that I've found helpful and I think are very important when reading the Old Testament. That is, first, of course, context. And context is, as we talked about, the, the first rule of good hermeneutics or Bible reading. Context, context, context. Like real estate is location, location, location. Scripture is context, context, context. Second is covenant, which is a huge uh, theme in rightly understanding the word of God is understanding the covenant promise given to us by God, starting with Abraham. Well, starting with uh, Adam and Eve, really, we're going to see. Canon, understanding how the Bible uh, readers looked at scripture and what they saw as God's word and what, and what they didn't. Fourth, one of my favorite ways of understanding the Bible, and the way we're going to understand it best, is knowing the character of God. The character of God. And you know that's a huge emphasis here at our church. And then, of course, Christ. Seeing Christ all through the Old Testament, the lens of, of the Messiah. Uh, which we did a lot of work when we were doing the Gospel Project on Wednesday nights. A lot of that in the Old Testament was designed to help us see and point to Christ. So context, covenant, canon, character of God, Christ. Five C's. Maybe one way to look at it. So let's look at number one, context. Yeah. No, it's okay. You stop me at any time. This is an open an open dialogue. Do you, do you have something to... I'll wait until you get to it. Okay, if I miss it. <laughs> yeah, any, any questions, just raise your hand. Call them to me. So number one, context. Understanding any biblical text, Old Testament or New Testament, begins by reading carefully in context. Most errors interpreting a text come from a misunderstanding of the context. Ask yourself about the author, the audience, date, author's intent. That's a big part of the context. What's the intent? What genre are you in? Historical narrative, prophecy, wisdom literature. And we talked about this in the inductive study a lot about the importance of this. But and. Uh, a good, uh, a good study Bible is helpful in getting you good context. I would recommend the ESV study Bible. Um, Reformation study Bible is a good one. Uh, but a good study Bible, if you need help getting one of those or don't have one, they're going to help you with the context. A good commentary, if you need, if you need help with your commentaries, um, they're going to help you with this. So knowing, knowing what you're talking about, who it was written to, and often in a good study Bible they will have, like the author, the date it was written, the theme of the, of the book, a whole bunch of you know, key passages, things like that. And that's going to help you know where it is in the biblical timeline. What kind of book is it? You know, is it, like I said, 66 books in the Bible? You can't read them all as wisdom literature. The whole Bible is not just wisdom literature, even though there's wisdom in it. There's a genre called wisdom literature. There's a genre called apocalyptic literature or prophecy, uh, like Daniel. Once you understand the genre of Daniel, Daniel makes a lot more sense. Or Ezekiel, Revelation, things like that. Look at the verses, chapters before and after the passage you are studying. Big piece to remember. Never read a single portion of Scripture in isolation. And that's what we like taking the, taking scripture without understanding the context of scripture, and that, that's sometimes what we call proof texting, uh, which you can proof text, just proof text rightly. Yeah. But often, if we just take a text uh, or look at it in isolation, or someone were to say, for example, "Do not judge," right? Well, understanding what Jesus was saying there is going to be only found in the greater portion of the scripture. Uh, for example, another one. Um, the unforgivable, unpardonable sin people talk about. Understanding what Jesus was talking about there and who he was talking to, the Pharisees, right? You got to know the lead up to what led to that is the only way you can understand really what the unpardonable. If you, if you just put that in, if you leave that in isolation, you can get with some weird interpretations that can be dangerous. But any hands? All right. That's <laughs> you careful when you're witnessing or getting into dialogue with us. Well, steady atheists. Mm -hmm. They'll try to trip you up. Right. Here, which actually is the truth, but uh, they leave out the orthodox in the whole context. Right. Right. What it is that they're trying to prove by a 
portion of scripture or a particular verse of scripture. Right. And that's why a good thing is says, okay, if someone has a, a, a single text and has developed an idea from it, particularly if you're dealing with someone who's hostile to the faith, say, okay, well, let's read the whole chapter and then we'll talk about it. That's a good way to get people, you know, often people don't want to do that because, well, they're lazy. <laughs> So I won't, I won't stick too much on this because I know we've talked about this a little bit already. Okay, second, and here's a big one that I want to focus on today, covenant. Understanding the Old Testament is going to be understood rightly through the lens of covenant. Because if we remember, the Bible is a story of redemption, a story of God's work, a story of God's promise towards people like ourselves. So another key concept to understand is the progressive unfolding of God's plan in the Bible through covenants. Theologians often use the phrase progressive revelation. Um, and we'll look at what that means. Well, <laughs> we'll look at what that means. I won't ask you what that means because it might be hard. So progressive revelation is what we observe as we read the Bible. God's plan of salvation <coughs> is revealed progressively from the beginning and culminating with Jesus Christ. The way God reveals this plan develops sort of like a seed growing into a tree. And similar to how the church is developing, you know, Jesus used the mustard seed analogy of it growing and then being revealed. And, uh, God's plan starts out as a meager seed. Eve, Eve seed, in fact, right? Through the promise of through you, Eve, although you have transgressed against me and rebelled against me, through you I will work my grace and bring about one who will reverse this whole thing and crush the head of the snake. But eventually blossoms into a beautiful flower of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Um, and there's there's many different, uh, not to get too technical, but some of you might be aware that depending on your theological background, um, there's many different ways of viewing the covenants. The, the way we teach here as Reformed Presbyterians is we teach what was called covenant theology, um, which we're going to look at. There is another way of viewing the Old Testament that I find to be um, just incorrect and unhelpful, and that's called dispensationalism. And that, that really segments or cuts things up into particular dispensations that are different, yet the same, um, that have to do a lot particularly with the difference between Israel and and the church today, when covenant theology would really see a streamline of <coughs> true Israel is the true church. True Israel, like the, uh, today, the true church is true Israel, is Israel. And uh, dispensationalism would, would like to kind of maybe cut that up or see different dispensations for different periods of time. So we're going to show you and look at uh, the covenant theological approach, which is a reform distinctive um, but there are some reform people who also have a different views on dispensation. Yes, sir. And the reform view sees grace from the beginning to the end. Correct. Yes. Instead of the dispensation of earning, earning law, and then grace, but it's all been grace. Even, even under the law, it was, it was grace. Showing grace. Yes. The animal side, for your sin, you're not there. Right, and even then, it never took it away. Took, yeah, God still had to, and we're actually going to see part of our scripture today in Romans that uh, God's. Well, Paul says that he longed the long uh, loving kindness of God that has forbeared the sins of the people of the Old Testament until this now revealing in Christ. So, it's God has carried His people from day one, Adam and Eve, clothed them in pure grace to the present moment. Jesus said, Abraham was glad to see my day. Yes. <laughs> yes, he was. Because it was the fulfillment of what is happening progressively. So we're going to look at that. If anyone is confused on that, don't be. It's okay. We'll get there together. Ask questions. Keep asking questions. So along the way, we see snapshots of the progression from seed to flower in the form of covenants. So we say covenants, but it's one covenant progressively, continuously being restored in a sense. So as we're gonna look at, there seem to be different times where God 
reestablishes that same old covenant of the Messiah with different people, but each time it's progressing and it's it's revealing more. That's the whole point. So it's not individual necessarily totally different covenants as maybe a dispensationalist would see it as a dispensation, but one covenant that is progressing. A covenant is a formal agreement between two or more persons, usually involving requirements, promises, and stipulations that had to be kept if the covenant were to remain firm. <coughs> say that again? Is this what my slide reminds me? A covenant is a formal agreement between two or more persons, usually involving requirements, promises, and stipulations that had to be kept if the covenant were to remain firm. And remember we talked about uh, the covenant that was progressively unseen, but initially laid in Abraham, which was this covenant of the cutting the blood and in the trench. And then we see that God essentially walks through the blood himself and Abraham's asleep. And this was, of course, we understand was pointing to the crucifixion that is to come, that God says basically if, if if this covenant isn't kept, let what happened to these animals happen to me. And that's precisely what happened to his son. Uh, the covenant is shown in that progressive way when Isaac is going up to the top of the hill after uh, God told Abraham to sacrifice your son to me. But the knife is stopped and, and Abraham says God will provide. So we see this... Uh, the requirements and promises, but it was always God that was holding the keys, was holding the grace. When we read the Old Testament, we should ask ourselves, therefore, what covenant am I in? What covenant am I in? What were the requirements, promises, and stipulations that had to be kept in the covenant? So let me show you a diagram. Two diagrams here, one over the other. So this is this this first one here is a good diagram of, of covenant theology. And covenant theology says basically this, that there was a covenant between amongst the Trinity before the foundations of the earth called the covenant of redemption. And this is what we see uh, regularly spoken of in Paul's writings about the um, what we call predestination or the sovereign will of God, that before anything ever happened, God had a plan. Amen. He had a plan, a plan of redemption, a plan of love that was amongst the Trinity, a plan that Christ would do what he was going to do. This is hard for us to understand because we're linear, time-bound people. But the plan of redemption, and um, I should have put the verse up here. There is scripture to back that up, that before the foundation of the earth, this was um, understood amongst the Trinity. When Adam and Eve were created, they were given a covenant of works. And that was, do this and you will live. Don't do that or you will die. That was the covenant of works. Now, some, some dispensationalists would see the covenant of works extending until the time of Jesus and his redemption. We say no, as Ted was saying, the covenant of works ended in Adam and Eve's failure. And that is the fall. But immediately, what was established was the covenant of grace inside of the covenant of redemption. That immediately because of the fall, we needed grace. God said, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And death is, we are all going to die. And that is part of the curse of our rebellion. But he has given us and extended in grace. He has forbeared with us. He's been long-suffering with us and giving us time to receive and to bring about his redemptive plan through Jesus Christ. So as soon as, as soon as God clothed them, that was an act of grace. As soon as God sent them on their way and didn't kill them on the spot, that was an act of grace. As soon as God said to Eve, through you, I will bring about the blessing of the Messiah, that was pure grace. So we have been clothed and protected by pure grace that God has foretold in us and he's given us a promise and the covenant of grace began here and then you see different covenants within that same covenant that are progressive and this, this kind of shows it a little bit differently 
Adam's covenant, covenant rule of husband, covenant form marriage, covenant sign Sabbath. So you see, as we talked about, the different uh, within that same covenant, the promises, stipulations, blessings, and curses, the roles, the form, the sign. So initially, the covenant was given, and we see God specifically giving us an understanding of marriage in that covenant form. Covenant role of Adam is husband, marriage, Sabbath. This remains, but it progresses. Covenant role of Noah. We see it's reestablished in, in the rainbow. The same covenant, not a new covenant, but it's, it's progressed. And that is covenant role of the father, many nations coming out of Noah, covenant form, the household, and then the sign of the thing signified was the rainbow. And then, of course, it comes to the next level in Abram. You know, the covenant role, of, of, he was like the chieftain or the, the top dog, but covenant form of the tribes, and circumcision was the sign. And see, it's progressing. Moses, judge, nation, Passover. All of these things, each time that the covenant is progressed, that does not negate the prior realities. Understand? So it's not, oh, no more does this matter. No more does this No, it's, it's progressing within the same promise. So just to help you understand, we don't see... This is no longer important. This is no longer important. We see a progression and a fulfillment. So to Moses, to David, and then of course, the covenant of grace reaching its climax and its fulfillment as 1 Peter was telling us in Jesus, who has the supreme covenant role of royal high priest, covenant form, Catholic church being the, the universal church, the covenant sign, the Lord's Supper. This, this uh, must have been a uh, the, the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. So we see these different covenants. But now everything is established and perfected. We no longer need David, Moses, Abraham. Even though these were true, it's perfected now, as the writer of Hebrews would say, in Jesus Christ. The truths of these were right and good, as as Paul tries to help us understand in the law. But now we've actually reached the fulfillment. So when we read scripture in the Old Testament, you have to ask yourself, as we said, what covenant am I reading? And knowing what covenant you're in and the stipulations of that covenant and the signs is going to help you interpret the scriptures. And that's why we're going to look at when you get into the uh, covenant and it, it's height of revelation in Moses. You have to know that, oh, I'm, I'm in the covenant, I'm in the stipulations of Moses, I'm in what he talked about in Deuteronomy, and that's going to help me understand why the people of Israel were doing a certain thing, because the covenant form was very much about the nation. So therefore, the nation has particular rules and rules of judgment and rules of living that are within that covenant. Does this make sense? Yes. Yeah, that, that third line is really helpful. Okay, that, that, that's, it's, it's kind of like what C.S. Lewis writes about um, that uh, God takes Israel and he's going to show Israel what it means to be the people of God. And if I'm an Israelite, I'm looking up at this only from Israel, and I may not see the whole context, but yeah. as people living in the, this last one, we, we, we can see the whole progression. Right. And I, and I would, and I'm, I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm trying to say that this, this chart, uh, of course, I would just change some wording a little thing. I would also add that the covenant sign uh, in Jesus is not merely just the Lord's Supper, but baptism. Yeah. Or we would see a direct connection. That's why we understand infant baptism to be, um, as, as Presbyterians, we practice infant baptism because we see a direct correlation as it part of the sign of the covenant. All right. Jackie. Um, so can you explain um, more of the Moses with the nation and then David with the national kingdom and then, and then the throne of David? Like, this is a little confusing to me, I guess, what the national kingdom is and then the throne. Is. Yeah, so the emphasis here um, would be more on having a king when here it was the judges, essentially, and no king but God. And so... Because, as God said, uh, you guys are hard-hearted. <laughs> and 
God gave him a king, but it was pointing to the coming king of Jesus. Part of the covenant form there was in the, um, the establishment of Israel. The establishment of a, as not just merely a nation, but actually as a, a kingdom under a king, and that being David. Uh, and the covenant sign of that being kingship, uh, but that's where you get the Lord said to my Lord, take a seat at the foot, and I will uh, take a seat and I will make the, the uh, yeah, your enemies your footstool. I'll take a seat at your foot. Sounds good. And so there's this, there's this transition from David and the kingship of David that is pointed to the kingship of Jesus. So the covenant sign of, okay, a throne will be established, and David is kind of the precursor of that in some ways. He's pointing to that sign. So yeah, there, and I'm sure that um, with these two, you can use maybe better language to establish that than this chart is doing. Um, but essentially, the difference here between Moses and David is the transition from judges to an actual a king or a ruler. But that was still a precursor to Jesus. So basically, uh, God, all, all, all these uh, you know, kept to his promise, uh, and basically, uh, his people, including us, needed heart surgery. Basically, what it points to. Mm. It wasn't that there was something wrong with the law, but there was something wrong with our hearts. Right. And basically, you know, he talks about in Ezekiel uh, about removing the heart of stone and putting it into his, uh, a heart of flesh and then putting the spirit. He was telling us that we needed heart surgery. Right. Yeah, and it's a and, and it's a progressive unfolding. Thank God for that because. You have to think about it almost as, as a parent would discipline or train up a child. There's this, there's this maturity that is happening, right? And often when you are a young or elementary age kid, you need, some, you need discipline and you need correction. And we see that happening with the church, God's people. And the, un and the unraveling of that. So you look at this almost as this, this, the reason it has to be progressing and the reason God did it this way, I think, is precisely because we needed it. We needed to be disciplined and we needed to be um, mature through a process that was unfolding and unfolding. But this is huge because when, when I mean, you can tell I'm just trying to understand that. When, when you see it this way, you understand better the constancy of God and his faithfulness and how it's all on a holy plan. And intending no trashing of my dispensationalist brothers and sisters, there is a real danger there. And, and, and you very quickly get right back to where some churches are saying, well, there's a different God in the Old Testament. You can, you right. can get there if you, if, if you don't have this. Or that there was ever a, a way to achieve your salvation in a, in a, in a sense of works. Um, which is a real danger. Yeah, Nick. And I, I think, too, it helps us to avoid the arrogance of the modern. You know, that we think we've got something new, when instead the church throughout the last 1,500 years, 1,800 years, has had this understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and so even when it was, you know, 1,080, 1054, you know, the, the church was united, united. And so this all, you know, this was all important when I looked at them. They were doing it. They were doing, you know, uh, covenant communion. They are understanding the covenant all along through this. And then we come to modern age in the last few hundred years of separating it out. This you know, is potentially something new and good is supposed to come. And we say, oh, maybe not. Right, right. Yep. And that's very true. A lot of the dispensationalist theology came out of the 1800s, which was, as we know, where the majority of the Colts came out of as well, and a lot of kind of uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, uh, Seventh Day Adventists, Christian Science, all of this came out of the 1800s because of dispensationalism. And now, dispensation, like I said, they're, they're, dispensationalism is, is a broad camp as well. There are many, there are many different, uh, there are Reformed dispensationalists out there. I know that's hard to think of, but there are. And, uh, like you'll run into. Um, those of a, a Baptist persuasion, 
uh, Reformed Baptists, they like it, they understand the idea of the covenant, but to make their view of baptism work, they have to kind of finagle it a little bit. And so they will have a thing called progressive covenantalism, which isn't the same as what we're talking about when we come to progressive revelation. So there are there are some camps, and I, like I said, I don't want to be unfair to them, uh, that try to that, that work this a little differently. But what I'm trying to present to you is the orthodox standard view of covenant theology. That's the that, that's the view that we take here at our church, because it's also the view of the Westminster, and that's our standard of theology. So. But I do think I, I believe it's true, and. I think it's incredibly important for us to understand the Old Testament. Otherwise, we will get ourselves in trouble if we don't. The, the understanding of the covenant, the view of the covenant, is a huge interpretive lens. If you if you try to act like they're not there or, or divide them, you get a really weird turkey with a lot of weird parts. <laughs> Questions on that? I, I would look at you know if you, if you there, there are a lot, there are, I wanted to put like I could have put five different charts. There's a lot of cool charts that I think are helpful with Covenant Theology. If you go, just type in Covenant Theology chart online. But I found these to be helpful. And we go into a greater, we go into this in greater depth when we study the Westminster <clears throat> together, so. So, stare at your passage through the lens of the relevant covenant. There are two other patterns that help us understand covenants and this concept of progressive revelation. The first pattern we see in the covenant is creation, fall, redemption, new creation. That's basically established in each reminder of the covenant, reestablishment of the covenant is creation, fall, redemption, new creation. And you can see that if you go back into creation, fall, obviously with Adam, Noah, establishment, creation, recreation. And each of these, there's a little mini outplaying of the story of redemption each part of the covenant. Showing, ultimately pointing, that these are all flawed men, right? As we are. Who need grace. Pointing to, in a better and better way, the fact of redemption coming in Jesus Christ. So there's, there's a theme that can be seen in each part of the progressive covenant. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. The events of scripture follow this pattern. Adam is created and falls, but a promise is made, and children are born. The nation of Israel is established, but they sin and are judged, but a new leader comes and resets their affection for God. This happens over and over. Ask where your passage is according to this progression within that covenant. What's happening? Are they in their fall stage? Are they being redeemed? Is there a new creation? Is there a new a new king, a new promise? And you see this again and again. Uh, in the Old Testament and in the and in the prophets, that there is often a judgment that is coming that they're prophesying. But then there's always this little twist, usually at the end of every a prophet of, but there's hope, but there's hope, but there's hope. You see this clearly. You can ask yourself in, in the wanderings of Israel with Moses and all that goes on there that just drives you drives you batty, right? Where you see things going well and then the fall. It just repeats itself. But that is like you and I. We need, we need the grace of God. So, an example for us of how to interpret correctly. Leviticus 19.19 19. <clears throat> You shall not wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. And this is an atheist. An atheist will often do, or not even necessarily an atheist, but someone who's just hostile to the faith will go to pieces from Leviticus and say, how come you don't keep or do this? Exactly. And that's where we need to have our lens intact to understand why, to give a proper response. So, you shall not wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. We can't move directly from the text and apply it to our lives for the simple reason that we don't live under the Mosaic Covenant law concerning apparel. This law was given under the Mosaic Covenant and applied to Israel for the purpose of setting them apart as a holy and separate people. This command is part of a group of commands in Leviticus 19 that call Israel to conform to God's holiness by emulating the divisions in God's creation and by keeping separate from the pagan practices of the surrounding nations. 
So the, the mixture of two cloths was, was given to the people at that time because that was something that the pagans did. That was something that the priests, the pagan priests, and this is actually a command for the priests. The pagan priests, they, they mixed their cloth and had these different colorful robes and they did their sacrifices. And God is saying, you shall not do this because you are different. You've been set apart. You're a holy nation. But that, that does not immediately apply to us because that was part of the covenant that was given at that time. This is not known here. This isn't dispensational. This, it's all, this only is not for us now because it has been fulfilled. But it's still relevant and we can still preach this text understanding this, this is what Jesus talks about, the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. What's the spirit of the law here for us today that has continued? Be separate. Be holy. Don't be, don't be pagan. Yeah, well, and it's about the heart. Like, are we wanting to be like the world or are we wanting to be separate from the world? Yeah. And that, that, that's a big application. <clears throat> right? Think about all the ways that we want to uh, be like the world or participate or look very similar to what is secular or worldly or pagan. <clears throat> Particularly, this is a convicting for us as in the church and as pastors too. In what ways are we trying to Wear the interwoven cloth, in a sense, to, to keep our to make ourselves look a lot like the ballistic practices next door. That's the point. You shouldn't look anything like the guys that are sacrificing their children. That, that that's that's the point here, and that was that came down to a very letter of the law within that covenant. But you better tell your atheist friend this is no longer. A direct command for us because we're in the fulfilled covenant. We're no longer part of this this covenant that Israel is under. But it is true to me, atheist friend, that I am called to live a separate and holy life. Does this make sense? This is nuance. Yeah, because I, I, I hear you saying that's, that applies to the church today as opposed to uh, look different in the world, but we are in the world, we should not looking like the world, so people should be able to tell the difference between us as a church and the world. Yes. And this was, that, this was at one point a very specific command that needed to be followed, particularly for the priests. But as Jesus says, I did not come to abolish this, but to fulfill it. And as all we've been learning in Romans is that this will never save you, although it is pointing to something. We don't fall to the letter of the law, the spirit of the law. But this is no, we are not under this covenant statute. Although we're under the same, we're in the new covenant, part of the same covenant, we're no longer a part of this same statute, this same uh, obligation that was for that particular part of the progressive covenant. So basically, as you stand, we have that now in Christ. Yeah. And, yes. And the spirit of it remains. The moral spirit of it remains. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it's the nuance too. Thinking about um, in the context of the verse, like if, um, at that period, maybe it would have been easier to go buy clothes that were already made for the pagan priests. But God's saying, "Okay, Israel, no, I want you to trust me to provide fabric and materials and people who are capable to make the garments that I want you to wear. You know, where it's more work um, to obey the Lord and follow this up. But I don't know. I'm thinking like all the ramifications of." of context. Yeah. And, and, and well, and, and one of the, another passages that was given to the, it was a judicial law that was given to the people of Israel within that covenant, part of the statute, was um, among the judges that you needed, because people would go out on their, their rooftops at night because it was so hot. And so part of the law was you needed to build like a fence. I forget the name of what they called it, but a fence on your roof so that people didn't fall off. Parapet. What's that? Parapet. Parapet. There we go. Thank you guys. So you didn't fall off. <laughs> Now, is that something that everybody should have parapet on, on their house now? <laughs> no, but the boss, but but amongst they were in the judicial law that was, was given to them by God, and they followed it. But the spirit of that law continues that if someone gets hurt because you didn't shovel your sidewalk, right? That that 
you should you should uh, have to pay for that or something. You should you should be held responsible for that because you know someone you're not you're not helping you're not protecting your neighbor or the people around you. That's the whole point. People are like, oh, you don't parapet your house, so you're not following God's law. No, that was a statute given to the people of Israel. But why was it given? Was you know that's where we, that's a, that's a nuance between legalism and the, what Jesus was saying. Why was the Sabbath laws given for you for the for the, <laughs> for the sake that it's, if the donkey falls in the hole, surely you would get it out. Come on, guys. But why was it given? Right? Say something. Yeah. It was just just what you're repeating there, but the, God's law is good. You know, right. I mean, if you pick either God's law or man's law, we're talking about just a civil society. And so if I don't put a railing around my porch and somebody falls off, you know, I'm responsible. You know, right. If they manage to crawl over my nice railing that's full and sturdy and good and fall off, that's not my fault. You right. Know, it, it's just law, right? And so right. the tender mercies of the wicked are domination. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're Anything that comes up that's a good law is something that it would be biblical. You know what I mean? So the use of the law is real and good. But so often we want to make such a hard separation and say, okay, law only related to salvation. It's like, no, the law related to day to day life, not unto salvation, is good. Right, right. And we know this to be true because it's what made our world. I mean, the United States was based on, you know, elements of biblical law. British common law was very was based on elements of the Ten Commandments, and it is what has set the Western world apart. A book recommendation for you: Vishwal Mangalati, an Indian writer, wrote a book called "The Book That Made Your World," written from an Indian perspective about how the Bible, we as Westerners, we don't recognize that the Bible made our world everything that you know is less and less anymore today. But the things that set us apart and made it a great country and was attempting to follow the Bible to some level because it is good. It's how, and why would we not listen to what our creator has given us? So anyway, that's this is important for us interpreting. Interpreting. Of course, no script. Interpreting. Interpreting the scripture. <laughs> Make sense on that? Yes, sir. What covenant are you in? What's the statutes? Canon. The next Old Testament interpretive lens is the lens of canon. Canon is a term used for the collection of books of the Old Testament and New Testament. If you've ever read through the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, did you notice that the Old Testament <coughs> is full of itself? Ah, ha, ha. Oh, sorry. It's full of itself. By that, I mean the latter Old Testament writers frequently allude to or echo or refer back to previous passages. In the Old Testament canon. So not only is the covenants progressing, but scripture is building on scripture. Scripture that was written before is constantly being alluded to by the, the writer now. Um, promises are constantly being called back to by David, for example. Remember your promises. The prophets remember your promises. Moses, when he comes before God and, and they're, they're in trouble. He starts to say to God, but the promises, but the promises, right? We see again and again. And then, of course, when we get to the New Testament, it's just always looking back on the Old Testament. So we understand a helpful interpretive lens is by knowing where Scripture has already been and looking at the Scripture that the person is talking about. So if someone quotes a Scripture in the Old Testament, you need to then look at that scripture they're quoting and understand the context of that scripture to understand what they're trying to say. What's the intent of the author? And that is by understanding the canon. How did the author understand the scripture they're talking about? Yeah. So, um, we're reading Psalm 106 this week, and it's recounting everything, you know, from um, Moses all the way through. And, um, and But it was like... There, were, there was wording that put a spin on how I read the Old Testament, and I was reading it through Psalm 106, going, he rebuked the Red Sea, like, oh, that's interesting, or, you know, like, just how the, how the psalmist was viewing the Old Testament, compared to how I viewed it when I read, you know, yeah. um, Exodus and <laughs> things like that, and going, that's a different perspective, I never thought, or, you know, that's one of many, but it was like, wow, I a new lens to look 
to interpret scripture with scripture. Um, but yeah, that it was echoing all that had happened already, but it was through a different lens than mine. That's really well said. Yeah, that's our, our first commentary should be other parts of the Bible. Oh, rebuke, rebuke them. That's an interesting way of looking. Yeah. And that gives you some understanding of maybe what was being taught at that time as to how they viewed the Red Sea story. Um, and the words that they used in the translation. So, well said. So, let, let the scripture, the canon of scripture, and how it's understood. Um, the Old Testament is full of itself. So, for example, the Psalms often refer to events reported in the Pentateuch. As was being said by Katie. Psalm 95, do not harden yourself as at Mershaba on the day at Mesa in the wilderness. The latter portion of the book of Daniel, 9 to 12, is a vision that Daniel received that helps interpret a prophecy given originally to Jeremiah. So you'll see this again and again in the Old Testament as you read it. That obviously, the words and places, like we see in Psalm 95, are pointing back to things that happened to the people of Israel in their wandering period or the conquest. And what do you, how are you going to know what that is? Like, Meribah, like what, what, you're like, what is that? Who is, and you got, you got to go back to that story and understand it and look at the map and find time. And then you can really get to the, to the root of what the psalmist is trying to say. And we talked about that in an inductive Bible study. Pay attention to the names and the places and the dates. Um, so when you are reading any Old Testament text, ask yourself, what, if any, connections are made to the rest of the canon? One of the keys to making these connections is using a Bible that has good cross-references. We've talked about that. Good study Bible. So check those cross-references and use them to help get a grasp on what the passage means in the context of the entire canon. For your resources, too, if you know this church has a library, if you go down to the, to the left, uh, at the end of the hall here. I'm trying to fill it up with more resources. There are some good cross-references and cross-reference Bibles, um, some commentaries and dictionaries in there. If you don't have them, feel free to go in there and check them out and look at them. Uh, they're in there for your use. So when you're interpreting an Old Testament text that is quoted in the New Testament, and we'll talk more about this next week, by all means, follow the New Testament's lead. Amen? The New Testament interpret for you if it, if it can. The, the book of Hebrews is a great Old Testament commentary. <laughs> it's a wonderful commentary. It spells it out for us quite clearly. How does the New Testament author's understanding of this passage impact my interpretation? I want to show you a chart. Uh, and I'm actually going to give you another chart next week. But this is just super cool. Uh, <coughs> One of the secular magazines uh, put this out first, and it's showing the cross-references of the Bible and a visualization. So this is the Old Testament, this is the New Testament. And these are as many times as they are cross-referenced. Can, can you, can you found, isn't that insane? This understanding alone has led people to go back to the Bible. There, it's, there's no book like the Bible. It's amazing how it comments on itself and cross-references itself. I mean, just look at that. I'm going to give you a sheet of three pages next week that shows the amount of cross-references in every book of the Bible where it's referencing itself. The New Testament is... But what blew me away when you look at that sheet, the majority of cross-references, of course, Hebrews is one. The Revelation is nothing but Old Testament cross-references. I don't know, that, that, that blew me away, so I don't know, maybe. I think, that's, I think that's amazing. The uniformity, there's no book like it. There are 63,000 cross-references in the Bible. Not 100,000. Yeah. And also, it's balanced. It's, it's balanced. It's aesthetically beautiful. Exactly. <laughs> I just love looking at it. I don't know. Sorry. It's awesome. The Bible's awesome. Fourth, the character of God. Character of God. The character of God. The next interpretive lens is the character of God. Remember this. This is what God does when, when, when Israel, when, uh, when Moses says, I want to see, I want to see you. I want to see your goodness pass before me. What does God do? 
He basically, when he, when he does that, when he sees his back, God speaks of his character. The Lord, the Lord, is loving and merciful a thousand generations. Right? His, his character, yeah. Not only he's how personable and relational he is as a God. Yes. It's not just some mystical mist. Right. So he's very relational. Yes. I see, Moses. I hear and I care. I'm doing something. So the next interpretive lens is the character of God. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same God as he reminds us of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God. Therefore, take special note when reading Old Testament texts that speak of who God is and what God is like. We can be tempted to rush to life application, but often the right thing to do is just meditate on what the passage is saying about the Almighty God. Oh, yes, and, and, and here, once again, the Old and the New Testament, the, the way that they have to come together, um, my, my frustration with the previous church was, I call it, slap God on the back. You know, hey, how you doing, God? And, you know, God and I were buds, and, and they're all people and they're wonderful, but the holiness, the awe, the wonder, the fear wasn't there. And, and, and you have to have both parts. 100%. And that's why I said, you know, a lot of our reformed doctrines, we talk about like sovereignty or God's uh, pre predestination and his knowledge of things. We'll only ever understand that first if we, first by giving up our control. But of course, second, which is tied to that, the only reason you'll ever trust and let go and give control is when you know the person of God. That he's trustworthy. Right? What makes me trust Jamie as my wife with everything and never worry, never having to worry about whether certain things will be done or the kids will be fed is because I know her personally. I know her character. <clears throat> She's trustworthy. And God, as we talked about last week, God could just say, that's it, I said it. He has every right to do that, but he has said, hey, look, I'm trustworthy. This is who my nature is, loving kindness. And the only reason to say is like, okay, God, my ways are not your ways, and I'm okay with that because you're awesome. You're trustworthy. I can put everything into your hands. And not only that, God has gone to the, to the nth degree in, in having the incarnation of Jesus where the disciples could rest their head on him, and Jesus could say, how many fish and how many loaves you got, give it to me. So understanding the Old Testament, we will always raise our fists and say, oh, this is unjust. God is so unenlightened, right? <laughs> <coughs> Until we recognize like, wow, maybe it's not God who needs to change to my understanding of the world, but I need to change to his, right? child understands that I remember uh, <clears throat> my dad he, he would spank me for when I was when I was when I would do something wrong and one day he, he tells this story I don't remember it that well he said he's, he's, he spanked me and I just looked at him and he saw the resentment in my heart and he saw that like, it wasn't hurting me it wasn't working and he said at that point I realized I just sat you down Luke and I said you've got to trust me that when I tell you not to do something because I love you and you've got to trust me. I'm not going to beat you. <laughs> you've got to trust me. And when I when he sat down and I, and I realized that and I, I could see that played out in my life that when my dad tells me something and I, I respect him and I trust him and I know, I know his character. Like he could spank me into that, yes, and that may work for a period, but ultimately the, the maturity that has to come is 
I'm your father. I know what's best for you. I care about you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. And you have to trust me. When I tell you to do something, it's not to, 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 to spite you or to burn you on your anthill. That's the magnifying glass. It's not that. It's to, to help you. Right? And that's so key for us to understand about God. So that's a, a, a key part of um, when, salvation, when someone receives Christ as their Savior, it can't be just, I don't want to go to hell. I, I trust Christ. Yes. I trust his character. Now that will grow, right? Because I don't know his character fully at that right. moment. But 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 genuinely trusting you, it's almost like you can't you can't just as an act of your will trust somebody you have to understand something about who they are. Yeah. And we want God. So we're out of time here, so I'm just gonna finish up. Um, so in other areas we wrongly humanize God. To wrongly assume that God is like us in every way when he's not. Ask the question, what does this text teach me about the character of God? For example, such as Psalm 90 is a simple, simply a reflection by Moses on God's unchanging character. God is eternal and everlasting. He is sovereign over life and death. He is God of holy wrath. He is a God of mercy, pity, and steadfast love. Gloriously powerful and beautiful. And then, of course, the final interpretive lens, but certainly not the least. And we'll, we'll touch back on this next week. It's the most important. The Old Testament is Christian scripture. The Old Testament points to, foretells, lays the groundwork, teaches about, sets up, and previews Christ. When we interpret the Old Testament text, we want to ask the questions, how does this text point forward to Christ? How is this text fulfilled by Christ? And of course, some texts are just, there was a man who was from her, right? Okay. But ultimately, the story is going to help us interpret and understand what Jesus has done. Um, of course, the chief example of that is Jesus himself on the road to Emmaus. It says, and from the beginning to the end, he opened up the scriptures and showed how they all point to himself. And that's what we really want to help people do, particularly if we're leading a Bible study, is to see how it's pointing, proclaiming, setting up, previewing our Savior. Okay. Next week we're going to do the Old Test, the New Testament, how this place. Hold on to those sheets because we're using those same little sheets. Put them in your Bible.